This is the DRF Players Podcast. Here are your hosts, Peter Thomas Fornatel and Jonathan Kinchin. Hello and welcome to the DRF Players Podcast. This is show 354, the July 31st, 2018 edition. Saratoga and Del Mar underway, and that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today, as well as this evolving three-year-old picture uh, as we approach the middle of summer and really get into the heart of the summer meets. I'm your host, Peter Thomas Fornatel, back with you coming from the little house on the east side, uh, Mugs, the handicapping Labrador alongside, back up with me here at the spa, calling in from I don't even know where in the world, but I'm going to take a guess, maybe back on planet Texas after a busy weekend at Del Mar is the people's champion, Jonathan Kinchin. What's up, JK? I am back. I'm back in the planet Texas. It's, uh, I feel like I haven't been here very much in the last few, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the last well, few Well, that's because you haven't. You've I know. And it, it, all it's over not the even world. over yet. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to keep going quite a bit. So, uh, so always So much fun, to though. talk about. So much to talk about. You and I have not even spoken. I want to start off uh, selfishly, probably not, shouldn't be the lead over uh, Good Magic and Hofberg and all that exciting stuff, but uh, selfishly, I want to hear about this Del Mar betting challenge. JK, another top finish for you in contests in 2018, though not all the way at the top. You end up running fifth. You uh, get a Breeders' Cup seat, an NHC seat, 6000 in cash, and you also made a tidy penny on your bankroll. Uh, first of all, immediate emotions uh, about that fifth-place finish. Uh, I, I, when you had the whole lead up, I thought you were going to talk about me sweeping you in the head to head. That was really the victory of the weekend. But um, I, I, I had a joke about that <laughs> plan for later. But since you stepped on it, now I'll just let it go. No, I. Um, yeah, no, it was fun. I've I, I've I've struggled in in that contest in the past. I feel like I've left there every time I've ever played in it. I feel like maybe one time I didn't. I left with like with nothing. And so. Um, it's always tough when you're at Del Mar. The meat's tough in general, just because it's you know the racing, the competition. So, it was uh, it was good. I was happy to have have, have done well. It, it's you know it can be frustrating at times, but you know look, I, I was in first going into the last race with a fifteen hundred dollar edge over second place, and I had an I had a choice to 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 sit there and bet. Uh, and to sit there and, and, and see if anyone can't hit or bet. And and because I thought that the three favorites were the most likely winners, I came to the conclusion, and I don't know why, but uh, talking to Nick Tamaro and, and Jack Jenkins, we kind of came to the conclusion that if I didn't hit, I had a 25% chance of winning. If I didn't bet, if I just sat there. Um, because I liked the favorites, and someone would have to really like cold punch a favorite on top, and a lot of guys don't bet like that. Long story short, the fourth or fifth choice won, um, I didn't bet, and four people passed me. What did you? You bet zero in the race. I bet two hundred bucks. So uh, to me, that was just. I bet two hundred on the horse, a ten to one shot that I thought that was like my. Fa- you know, if I was playing in a contest, a two dollar win place, the horse I would use. I bet two hundred on that horse with the idea that if someone deep down like bet you know two thousand on him to win, I would at least move the goalpost a little bit. If that horse were to win, I didn't want to get beat on the horse I liked the most winning. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. I said, yeah, no. Put Rand in the mistake jar for that one. You've got me doing it now. Um, I absolutely understand the logic. And after the fact, do you feel like you played it right and got unlucky with the specific way that it came? Or do you feel like you do it again uh, differently? I could have aggressively, and I was prepared to aggressively risk oh, all you're there, my money. Okay. Yeah, I'm right here. Can you not hear me? Oh, no, now you're back. Now you're back. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I was uh, I, I was ready to aggressively bet it all and, and try to win the whole thing. But I, I eventually just decided not to because the, the return on locking it up in the late double that I could have gotten wasn't good enough to, to risk all that money and the prize money. It's so top heavy. I, I just didn't I just didn't want to be silly. You know, it's weird because in the Belmont contest, I I bet 30 in the last double and missed in this race in this situation i didn't but that makes me also feel like there's a rhyme or a reason for what i'm doing like yeah, you would have missed like you got to remember you would have missed you got to remember two things one you were hellaciously unlucky at belmont and you had a real opinion and here 
it sounds like you said you liked the top three choices and the fourth choice one, so you wouldn't have even hit it had you made the no, bet. Well, I, I, well, no, I, the, 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 that horse was covered in my kind of my, my, my get up double towards the end. Oh, okay. um, I thought that the other, I thought the three favorites were the most likely winners. And so that's why I wasn't, that's why I, I had some, some, some comfort there that one of those three would win and it would be a lot harder for someone to, to, to have a bet beat me, but. You know, so I, it is. I did hear I mean, it's my fault. And we had that little connection issue, but I didn't really hear an answer to the question. Are you put down as played it right, got a lucky, or are you, do you have regrets over how it all went down? No, played it right. Um, played it right. Got un- well, I don't know if I got unlucky. I mean, I, I guess I got unlucky because well, you got unlucky you know, that four people passed you. I mean, that's unlucky. Yeah, I thought. I, I honestly thought talking. You know, you know what happens in contests. You're talking to everybody. Anybody? You know anybody uh, that hit? One of us is cutting out, J.K. Um, we've had this happen before up here in Saratoga. Let's see if we can get us both back. Are you back? Yeah, I mean, I'm here. I'm in the same place I always am, so. Yeah, it's probably dodgy Wi-Fi up here. This is just dodgy part of the course. Dodgy Saratoga Wi-Fi? Te- te- technology has been absolutely killing me, this meet. I've spent more of the meet dealing with tech issues than I have um handicapping or betting horses at this point so it's not a surprise i don't know maybe your voice is going out over the air and it's just me who can't hear you but in any case it seems like we're going okay now we're just gonna have to fight through it just another just another paper cut in my meat of death by ten thousand paper cuts um but anyway you're here now and that's what matters any other thoughts on the del mar contest the winner sounded like an interesting character i'm hopefully going to get a chance to catch up with him a little bit later yeah, I ran into him at the at the PDJ, uh, PJF jockey thing, and I, I said, "Hey, give me your phone." <laughs> and he's ah. like, huh? "And then I texted, I, I told him, I put, I typed your number in, and I said, "Text Pete." JK told me to text you. I won the Del Mar contest, and he so he sent it to you because I figured you were going to want to talk to him. Young guy, um, hasn't played in a lot of contests, um, and I think he hit a seven thousand dollar win bet on the on the nine to two winner at the end to get to forty two thousand seventy five thousand in prizes. NHC, BCBC, pretty good weekend. Yeah, not too bad for a th- the 32-year-old. There was a line in Chris Barr's press release at, at uh, for the tournament that I did not pick up in my article because I had no idea what it meant. It said he was, and this guy, we should give his name, uh, Dennis Montoro. It said he was an analytics player. Do you have any idea what that means? Um, I don't. I don't know. I, I, we, we, we chatted for a little bit. Um, but not not uh, in depth in terms all the of, mo- of, of of what he was doing. Yeah, all the more reason why I'm eager to talk to him and hopefully get something going on. Um, all right, you mentioned the head to heads, a clean sweep for you, four zero. No, only the only race I have a little excuse in, and not even really then, is the promises fulfilled race with the scratch of World of Trouble. You you basically uh, kicked me uh, kicked me in the teeth this weekend, and it sounds like. The only bad news, and it's not that bad because you made enough money playing at Del Mar, but it sounds like the Del Mar races kept you from uh, betting too much cash on the Saratoga side. Was that the impression I was getting? <laughs> well, I had a I had a fun JK travel day. Uh, show up to Lexington's airport at 6 a.m. to fly to Dallas, Dallas and San Diego, and <laughs> the, the, the the Lexington Dallas flight is like oh, it's it it's never a problem. Like it never has been an issue. Well, this one goes full. I hop in an Uber up to Cincinnati. Jeez, it's an hour ride. Then I fly from Cincinnati to Dallas, and then I fly from Dallas to Orange County. I get in an Uber. It's a two-hour Uber from from Orange County down to to Del Mar, and I got there for the third race. So in the midst of all of that, of course, I missed I missed all the Saratoga action. I, mean, I watched it, but I just couldn't I couldn't uh, effectively come up with some ticket construction that was going to allow me to to take advantage of uh, of being pretty right through the through that run of races no absolutely you had uh, where should we begin well i'm just going to go in the order that they are on the drf website and that means we're going to start with what was simply a bizarre race in the gym dandy sure didn't look like a a, a grade two horses uh, veering out all over the place tenfold gets the job done with a 93 buyer speed figure would have been a little faster if he ran uh, straight I had an embarrassing moment up there in the secret spot at the paddock bar. Um, very strangely to me, I, I was checking prices in England, and 
you were able to bet both Vino Rosso and Tenfold before that race at two to one. So you're getting one to two on those two combined. Implied probability suggested there that they were 67% to win. I thought one of those two, especially as we got co- closer to the race, was 80 or 85% to win. So I made a I made a bet. And then I'm counting my money. And there's this incident in the stretch. And, you know, I'm pretty mild-mannered up, up there. There's a lot of people. It's mixed company. And a lot of people I don't know that well who, you know, might know me for the podcast or whatever. Apparently, as the horse bolted, let out a torrent of expletives. <laughs> Fortunately, there were no small children in the area. But after the race, I had multiple of the, the the regular crew, the boys from L.A., Lower Albany, coming up to me and saying, Pete, I've never heard. It's like, I'm not offended by it. Don't worry. But I've never heard you speak like that. <laughs> I said, well, I don't think I've ever seen a stretch run like that. That was my only possible excuse. But I will say this, JK, not the kind of run through the stretch that makes me excited to bet a horse back in a race like the Travers. Yeah, no, I... I Mistake uh, uh, Oh, did I say yeah, no? You did? Or did I go no, yeah? That was a yeah, no. Okay. <laughs> it was a bad race. Um, I wonder if, if Hofburg's connections are... Are, uh, are 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 regretting not running there instead of the other, you know, instead of on on Friday in the oh, curling. I I doubt it. I doubt it. I mean, I, I think it's. I, I think you could make an argument that Hofburg won the Jim Dandy. Um, you know, we always talk about Mott with a target, and I think it's easier to. Granted, I mean, who knows what would have happened had he run in that race? He probably just would have made more money. But I think when you have a carefully constructed plan for a horse and you see you see him win Hofburg, we're talking now, in the Curlin, the way that he did against the track, under wraps, super stylish, not super duper fast, though some figures had it pretty fast. Uh, Craig, Time Form US, I think had it 124. Um, I, well, let me take a look here what the buyer figure was, but it almost doesn't matter how because given how stylish it was and how geared down he was, I expect him to take a big step forward. Uh, but of course, and we'll get to this, let's stick with Saratoga for now. Uh, still might not be the favorite depending on what uh, other horses tend to do, but what did just sticking to the race on Friday, what did you think of Hopper? Um, I thought he was good. Um, you know, I mean, he was supposed to win, right? I, I guess there was a, a world in which the pace was going to be problematic for him. Um, I mean, the way that track was playing halfway through the day, was he supposed to win? I, I remember a certain wise guy, uh, I think his name is Jonathan Kitchen, telling me how much he was looking forward to betting against the horse. Well, yeah, I mean, not in that race. I, I mean, I can't wait to bet against him, but not there. Oh, I thought that was from before the curling. No, I don't I don't want to bet against him there. I mean, I, I guess that, you know, I actually had a Maybe it was somebody else. I saw a lot of wise guy chatter about how he could never win the way that track was playing, et cetera. Oh, no, 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 it wasn't me. I actually had a conversation with our friend Chris Felica from uh, College Game Day. He, he texted me and said... Am I crazy for trying to leave him off? And I said, I think it's a brave move, and I see the the value opportunity there when you're thinking that it, you know he, he just might be short. It's just a prep. There's no pace. The track, blah blah blah. But it's a very brave move and a dangerous one. I think that you know could be regretted. And I mean, he's just the best horse in the race. And it's one of those situations where, you know, if it, it, to me, if you want to try to beat a, a horse that's like a lot better than you, and you have a pace edge. We talk about it all the time, man. That forty-nine and change business that just kind of, you know, not that they did that, but I'm just saying that that not opening up is 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 problematic for me. I think you're about to absolutely go on and go with it. So, yeah, of course, this horse was winning no matter no matter what the pace was in front of him. Just so superior to that field, and it's not that I think it was such a strong field that makes me like him for the Travers so much as the stylish way he did it. The buyer did come back pretty good, hundred. Uh, as opposed to the 93 of the dandy, but more just the stylish way he did it and just knowing that coming from that operation, it, it, that was just a workout for the Travers. You've got to expect him to come on for that run. And we'll talk a little bit more about that race later in the show, but let's move on, to, or not really move on, stick with some of those Saturday races at Saratoga. I, I assume you got a chance to be in place to at least watch them? Uh, yeah, well, two of them be a... Via the via the uh, power of the uh, cellular internet in the car, but yeah, I, I watched two. I watched them all. 
the Vanderbilt was certainly the one. I mean, you'd want to talk about a jaw-dropping performance, uh, the performance of the Saratoga meet so far, no offense to, to Monomoy Girl, was probably this tour de force from your boy Imperial Hint, who you just did absolutely everything right and looked close to perfect, scoring a 108 buyer speed figure. But once again, the way that he did it was just so impressive and imperious and just looked a, a different class. Um, anything to add on Imperial Hint? I, he, he, you, you expected a run like this, which, which you know, you were dead right and I was dead wrong about it. I wasn't sure which direction his form was going. That arrow is only pointing one way and it's up. Uh, I remember at one point uh, the the uh, the previous um, the previous CEO of DRF John Harding. Uh, I the first time I met him was at American Pharaohs um, uh, Belmont, the Triple Crown, and I I was walking away and he asked me what I thought. And I said American Pharaoh will win by five or win by six or whatever. I just said a number, just trying to be cheeky, and the horse did it. And I remember someone telling me that he was like so impressed that I nailed it. <laughs> and I just I just got lucky. And it's kind of the same thing. I was just trying to be arrogant that I thought Imperial Hint was going to run well. And I said for fun. And he actually did win for fun. Um, <laughs> I wish I was always that right. Or if there was a bet you could place. What if you had bet on Imperial Hint to win by fun? For you fun. can do <laughs> – you can bet margins in the U.K. That is a fun thing. Um, I've actually never done it. But you would see a market in a race like that potentially. Um, you know, whatever the over-under would be, a length and a half, two lengths would probably be something like that uh, for the three to five shot that he was. And he ended up uh, just making a making an absolute mockery of it and giving giving the impression that he could run faster if needed. I think that was probably the most impressive part of that performance with with the Hofberg situation to understand in my mind how impressive that is you kind of need to know a little bit of the narrative a little bit of the backstory Mott with a target and all that stuff uh, to be super impressed and think that Imperial Hit had more in the tank all you need is a pair of eyes yeah absolutely he's fast he, he sits off he runs fast numbers he runs fast numbers in 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 different places I mean he ran well at Del Mar last year he's you know run well at every other you know mid-Atlantic track he runs well at Saratoga here. He ran well at Belmont. I think he's uh, he's without a doubt probably the I – mean, not probably. He was without a doubt the sprint favorite at this point. He's versatile. I think he's extremely, extremely talented. And, um, you know, I, I'll be interested to see what they do. I don't know if they're going to try to stretch him out for the forego. It seems like that might come a little bit – not too quick, right? What do we have, three weeks until the Travers? Four uh, weeks? Yeah, I think that's right. It's the 25th. Yeah, so I, you know, and then, you know, that's yeah. kind of coming back quick off of a big effort, and then running and running, going. You know, that's well. The four goes. The four goes is is, is uh, Labor Day weekend, isn't it? Oh, is it? Yeah. So I, I mean, thought I, it was the same day as the Travers. Cause oh no, you're had, right. They moved when they went with the Super Card. I think you're right. I think you're right. The last few years, because think about some of the horses we've seen Trey, on the Travers Trey the Farm, undercard. Right? Yeah, exactly. You're absolutely okay. right. Yeah, so I don't know if they'll do that, but we'll see. I, I'm excited to watch him run, and I think he'll be uh, – he's a, he's definitely going to be tough going six at, at Churchill. He didn't run well at Churchill um, per se, but it was also a funny track that day. Right. I mean, I'm going to take a look right now on Odds Checker, and I'm just curious what you get. He looked – the idea of him in the Breeders' Cup, I mean, you know, none of them are unbeatable, but he looked like he's going to be – we looked like an even money chance for the Breeders' Cup, just visually, right? So let's let's see what the actual price is, um, if anybody's offering. And, and his uh, and his style is, is is what is is what is kind of appealing to me. Is he's never going to really get himself in a ton of trouble because he he can take the lead if they're crawling, which they don't ever crawl in that race. He can sit right off behind. He, he's he, you know he's Javier's got the thing to shut all the way off. I mean, I think he's going to be tough. Yeah, I agree. I'm seeing the best price available is 11 to 4, 9 to 4 available from places that we could probably get a bet down. That's interesting to me. No runner, no bet, or how? What, which one? Which no, one no, it would be action. It would be action. Mm -hmm. So you got to, you got, you'd have to. But I mean, I don't know. That's that, there's enough juice there that I'd, I'd be a little bit well, interested. In that. So I think if we back up, we're in race seven. If we back up one race, there might be some reasons to, to question. Uh, if that's a good bet or not. Go ahead. I thought Promises Fulfilled was amazing. He was I mean, I thought, I thought he ran really, really well. And, and I agree. I, I think that from a head-to-head -head 
wagering standpoint, I was very fortunate that World of Trouble wasn't there. I don't think it would have mattered. I'm not sure it would have mattered. Is just because yeah. look at what he did on the clock fractionally. You know what I mean? I mean, it mattered in the sense that I wouldn't have made the bet. But I mean, but that's not really the same thing as a vet. that. That's a little side story. The real story is what he did on the track. And when you look at how hard he went from the get go, earning the same buyer speed figure of 108, showing that he does. I always was part wondering if it wasn't that he was more about a uh, uh, good speed, but more route speed. No, no, no. This is sprint speed. This is a serious horse. Um, I still visually, uh, you know, it, sitting here thinking ahead to the Breeders' Cup, I mean, Imperial Hint is going to be considerably shorter as of now, I'm sure, in these future markets. But what you're saying ain't crazy. That, that, that was an absolutely serious run, and kudos to you for coming up with it. I'll tell you this. Uh, nowhere that we could bet, but some 12 to 1 out there available in the world on promises fulfilled for that race. Also pretty darn interesting. Or am I once again, oh, because, no, the Breeders' Cup isn't in California. It's always, I always go get on these East, Eastern-based horses and get in trouble when they go out and race in California <laughs> for the Breeders' Cup sprint. Don't have to worry about that this year at Churchill. Not only is it not in California, it's in Dale Roman's backyard, like literally in his backyard at Churchill <laughs> Downs. So promises fulfilled, we'll get to go home and train uh, train up to that um, and is out of his own stall. Here, here's, you know, uh, Nick Tamaro, we hung out with him this week and give him some credit for this whole idea. But this horse reminds me of a narrative that, that we've seen a couple times, right? Uh, Rachel Alexandra and Bodie Meister, no one will ever say that those horses didn't get tested on the front end. Um and, and one of the reasons they'll say that is because both of them were tested, were tested and put away future Breeders' Cup sprint runners, right? Big drama in the uh, in the Preakness that, that Rachel won, and then um, Trittyberg in the in the Derby where where Bodie Meister was. The, the idea that Justify didn't face any pace types or any quality pace types is ridiculous. This horse just ran a one twenty seven and a one thirty time form U.S. sprinting on the front end, an extremely fast pace. And the Woody Stevens, an extremely fast pace here. Um, I, I think that this needs to be a little bit of a notch on the belt of Justify when we're yeah. trying to evaluate the unfortunate. We had the unfortunate task of trying to evaluate how good he was because he didn't get to stay on the track long enough to confirm it for us. This is a notch on the good side and the good tally uh, for, for, for what he did by putting this horse away. For sure. There's reflected glory there, and it definitely speaks to the – to. Uh, it, it's not like he was uh, – in that crazy derby pace, it's not like he was beating tomato cans. And it ties into the, what, I, what I've said about him. I feel like, in a way, we weren't able to get the best of Justify from a, a final figure perspective precisely because of – having to, to to run with and tackle and deal with a horse and a pace like he did in the Derby. If you just look at that race from an ability perspective, you've got to move that final figure uh, way up. And I think that is something to consider. And, and it is one of the great regrets I have. Again, not criticizing anybody. I totally get it. I think it's the right move for the horse and everybody involved. But wouldn't it have been fun? To get to see to see arrested, maybe a little bit grown up, justified, and what he could have done in the fall. I have to believe, I have to believe that we that, that his best um, had he stayed healthy and had it made sense to keep him in training, uh, his best would have been yet to come. And, and I agree, uh, promises fulfilled, and what he's done since definitely are a, are a positive retroactive form boost for whatever that is worth. So those two numbers, J.K. Uh, nine to four. Imperial hint, 12 to 1 promises fulfilled. Granted, this is kind of phony because they're not the 12 to 1 isn't even some isn't something we could bet right now. That could probably that could quite possibly just be like a residual number that's going to be slashed to six tomorrow or at any point we could bet it. But am I correct in assuming you'd rather have those the 12 than the nine to four? Or would you bet, as I'm tempted to do, bet both of them at those numbers? Yeah, this is – so here's my thing. I mean, don't you think that you could, you're going to get pretty – okay, you're not going to get 9 to 4, but even if you get even money on Imperial Hint on the day, I, I, I just have to believe 
that I can narrow the field before or the field after and get close to nine to four into Imperial Hinton doubles or out of Imperial Hinton doubles. And that way I don't have to worry about the uh, fact that he's not that he could or could not run. I mean, that's that's a way of looking at it. You know, nine to four isn't it's not a sexy future book price. I, I do contend that it is value, though. I, I would still uh, if the choices were buy, sell, hold, I, I would I would firmly be. I'd firmly be buying on both those numbers. I, I wouldn't want to be. I wouldn't want to be on the other side. And it'll be real interesting to see if he does end up running back up against here. I don't know. I'm kind of with you. It seems like maybe the plan would be wait, prep a little bit later, Breeders' Cup. But I don't know. We we should we should take a look. There's probably an article on DRF.com right now that uh, is speculating with with some more facts in the holster about what the future is going to hold. Like I said, I've been too busy trying to get my computer to work to uh, to be fully up on all the news in the world of uh, thoroughbred racing. Between that and uh, between that and solo, between technology and solo childcare, I'm I'm uh, I'm not as prepared as I, as I'd like to be for the show. <laughs> if I'm being perfectly honest, but we'll take a look and we'll have you know months to discuss this. Let's move on to some more of the action from Saratoga from Saturday before we take a look out west. Let's talk about uh, the Bowling Green, J.K. What were your what were your thoughts here? Crazy race. Yeah, I think Sadler's Joy is 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 officially the best horse in training that you cannot single. <laughs> I like it. Which he he's he's just so good. He's so talented. He always makes a run. He tries hard, uh, but he is always going to be the victim of a perfect ride. I won't even say a, a pace, just a perfect ride because he can win in a slow pace. He just has to have a perfect ride to do so. So, uh, you know, he, he's such a good one. I, I think he's really talented. I know glorious empire ran really well for, for Julian let Peru. And I don't think Javier's riding Sadler's joy is wrong, but in the guessing game of getting the best ride for him, it feels like Julian has guessed right more than other people. So maybe there's a, 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 a reason to look back at him. Um, and, and, uh, you know, he, he ran, he rode glorious empire well on the front end. It, you know, they turned for home three up that that's, that's the kind of front running race that you have to ride to take advantage of a pace scenario. When, when you open up on these horses, it really throws them for a loop and, and your horse gets brave and, and you take advantage of what your weapon is rather, tr rather than trying to quicken home with horses like channel maker, Sadler's joy, bigger picture, you know, all those horses that makes it a little bit more challenging. So it was a great ride by Julian. I, I I've always said is, is sometimes he doesn't find his way there when you'd like him to, but when he's on the lead, he is extremely, extremely tough. Yeah, absolutely. The fair Hill angle coming into play there too, quite possibly at the end of uh, mile and three ace turf race. You wonder if Julian didn't have a little special bit of uh, satisfaction giving his uh, his history with Sadler's Joy. Channel Maker, though, ends up with the dead heat. I thought he got there for all the world in that last jump. Even on the slow-mo, I thought his nose just ticked it. But when you see the still photo, indeed, a dead heat. Channel Maker, a horse I've liked a lot in the past. Wasn't smart enough to come up with him on Saturday. But you did, JK, and you're out of the gate video uh, comment on on that performance and uh and him with joel rosario yeah and i thought he was good i've, I've always um i've always uh, kind of had his attention I, I think he's the type of horse that um i haven't always been warm to but then i've heard a lot of people that i respect like him so i started paying attention to him and he's he's run well he, he ran well at keeneland he's run well um he's run well all over the place and so i thought he was just a talented horse that might like the extra ground and uh, he's probably one to be heard from. I don't think he's going to win any any big big races, but uh, definitely a, a useful uh, turf long on the turf type. I was very disappointed. The only good thing about my uh, my Manitoulin idea was at six to one, I felt no special need to do any pressing. The, the world seemed to cotton to that uh, that trip. I wondered if the width of the trip last time didn't maybe lead to like a low sheet number or something that attracted some unwarranted attention and definitely the disappointment of the race to me. And, and I still, I'm trying to figure out what the heck happened to my guy. Hi, happy. You're, you're almost irrational dislike of the horse coming for the, from in the last couple of races, JK paid off big time on Saturday. Have you figured out why you've never liked that horse? And, and, uh, and uh, you, you could take a victory lap for, uh, for anti-touting. I seriously don't know. 
<laughs> I, I mean, I guess it's, I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe it's a, I keep on wanting to say this. It doesn't make sense. I guess it's a Todd long on the grass probably is like probably the thing he's the least best at, but he's still pretty darn good at it. I'm sure he's had some good horse that's laughing in my face right now that I can't think of that was long on the grass. Um, and, 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 and he, he's just kind of a grinding type. So it, those horses can win races, but they're not the type you want to lean on when you're facing these really grade one stamina based quickening types. I just don't think that that really gets the job done that often. So it's somewhere in that realm, but I really don't know why. You've got to figure the ground had something to do with it. I mean, the best races are on the dirt still for the horse. Uh, I'm guessing the only way I can explain a race, uh, you know, that dull from a horse who's shown that much talent is maybe some lack of affinity for the uh, for the cut in the ground. The turf courses, I do want to go back and watch a bunch of turf racing from the weekend because it it just uh, it feels like there's something going on that I haven't quite figured out yet with like paths or 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 speed versus closers or something. There's there's been enough um, good performances that I didn't fully understand and enough bad performances from horses I thought would run well, that I'm wondering if there isn't some th- sort of subtle bias or issue going on on the turf. But this is all just speculation at this point. I need to hunker down and take a look. What's your thought? Have you noticed anything in terms of uh, bias of any kind at Saratoga so far? No, I haven't. And I, and I you know, I, what, what, what happens with me when I'm going back and forth, they kind of put all my attention in one place while I'm there. Like I don't even sure. barely look at Del Mar when I'm in Saratoga. And then hey, you're I'm competing in- for a hundred thousand in the Del Mar yeah. contest. Nobody's going to blame you for not, uh, not having, you know, these yeah, answers, answers just to my down the this- rabbit hole questions. Yeah, no, I, I haven't, and I haven't heard anything either. So, um, but I am interested when you find out, let me know. Cause I will be back in, back in action for the next 10 days or so. 12 days we'll be out there. Excellent. Let's talk about the Bing Crosby, the big race from, uh, Del Mar on Saturday. Your old pal, Ransom the Moon, getting that one done. What did you think of that effort? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell a story, and I was a little bit hesitant to tell it because I didn't know. If, I, it's not oh, meant to be it. mean. It's it's just, but I, I two years ago, a year and a half ago, two years ago, I can't remember. Maybe it was last summer. Uh, I ran into uh, Mark Martinez He's from San Antonio, Texas. He's one of the owners, or if not the main owner of Agave Racing uh, who has Rance in the Moon. They've partnered on other horses with Little Red Feather. Uh, successful man, obviously, most are that are getting involved in the ownership of horses. Um, I was introduced to him like by a mutual friend, and he had, you know, found out the podcast and handicapping tour champion or whatever, and he asked me what I thought of Rance in the Moon. And last year, I told him, I, I think the horse is awesome. I love the horse. I actually, the horse had just won at seven furlong. I said, I I know he's got a late running sprinter, but I actually think he's better at six. And I think he, I think you guys are going to have a huge shot in the Breeders' Cup sprint. And just like a, probably a parent with his kid that, you know, you find it, you know, you don't, you don't want anyone saying anything bad about your kid. You can only say something bad about your kid. He kind of got like a little bit like a fit. What, 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 I, what do you mean he can't go seven? I was like, well, no, no, I'm not saying he can't go seven. I'm just saying I think he's best going six. Yeah, I just think that two he's, very I different think ideas. Right. Yeah. And, um, and so we kind of were going back and forth. And I said, hey, man, look, you asked me. I, I don't know. Right, I don't, right. I don't, don't ask a question if you don't want to hear the answer. So anyways, I was very excited when he when he won this race at, at six. I, you know, I, I thought his race two back in two years last year in this race was 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 really good. But it was it was marred by the fact that Dre Fong lost Mike and carried Roy H out. And then Roy H went back and won the Breeders' Cup sprint. So then there was this validation that that Roy H was 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 always better than Ransom the Moon, but um, I thought Ransom the Moon ran huge, and and I, and I don't care if Roy H was a little bit short. Ransom the Moon won pretty impressively in that race, and so uh, it was definitely fun to watch. And uh, I'm a big fan of that horse, and love to see him at at, uh, at Churchill again with with some real pace to run into, with promises fulfilled. And Imperial Hint, he's one that could have a could make some noise going six furlongs on a on a track that that happens to be pretty fair and, and usually. Uh, out at Louisville. It's a good point. You know, you see a hundred buyer speed figure as opposed to the hundred and eight that those other two ran, but because of running style and because we're talking about the Breeders' Cup sprint and its abundance of speed, that's a situation where uh, 
if the pace is cooperative, the the eight points of speed figure between the top two and this one maybe aren't as big as they seem. You think that's fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and, and the other thing that that I'll point out here is is you know I'm I'm wrong a lot, and I have a lot of really silly uh, opinions. But one thing, and I think you can make a lot of money if you can if you can get a great idea about any random situation in racing, especially when it's a horse that takes a lot of money. I just have this. I just am convinced that American Anthem is a seven furlong or longer horse. I just don't. I don't think as a forward type he'll ever win a six furlong race against the likes of these types of horses that can really run early. And he always takes money, and he'll always continue to take money. And so, if you have a, a pet horse like that that you feel like you can you can um, really bet against a horse, you have a real a negative, at least an idea of something that they don't do well. Make sure you pop those in your stable mail as well. You don't need to just have the horses in there that you uh, want to bet back. There's also the opportunity to get the horses in there you want to bet against. It's a great point. Uh, Two ninety to one as a horse. I don't know if you said said this publicly before, if we're just at the, if we're semi red boarding, but I mean that's that's great information to have. You're you're taking the takeout out of the mix and 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 tilting the the wheel in your favor when you can come up with opinions like that. So you didn't have an excuse for American Anthem. You just think that's no. Not, he's not going to be able to do that against those types. No, I was all in on day one in the contest and the doubles, and I used horses. I used a, a very I used four horses in this race, and he was not one of them. I used Roy H. Ransom the Moon. St. Joe Bay and stall walking dude. There's a five to two shot on the board for my tournament life. That was trained by uh, the silver hair himself. And I didn't. <laughs> you had to leave the wig at home for that one. JK stall walking. Dude <laughs> oh, don't, don't worry. I, I no, no, I just left it at the hotel. I had the wig on in full effect on, on Sunday. Well, let's move on to Sunday and we'll start West and then we'll work our way back East. Uh, talk about your uh, your big play on Sunday and uh, when you were do when you were doing the wig jig. Yeah, it was uh, it was interesting. We we had I had been talking about it with various people all morning. I I texted with Marshall Graham and and I just told everyone that I wanted to bet fourteen thousand dollars on a double with Unique Bella into the uh, uh, the Baffert Furster. Um, I'm going blank on the name, but I'll get it Roadster in in the race after that. And my fear, and, and most people would say, oh, that doesn't make a lot of sense, is that my fear was that um, there wasn't – I was going to kill the pool because the average pool that weekend had been like between 55, 60, about $60,000. So obviously betting 14 to 1,000 into one was going to be a problem. Um, so what I decided to do was um, I, I decided that, that just like we talked about a couple weeks ago with – the Jason service horse for Inze fire and how the uh, quote unquote CRWs, the computers bet late and made a huge bet late to check, to, to adjust that price to where, for whatever reason they felt like it should be. And I thought here, what would happen is if I would bet that money and I would make that combination very unattractive, to players and to computers that they would correct it and, and come back and, and make it a little bit better. So when I first bet it, that it was paying like 240 and then it started to creep up and it was slowly creeping up as I was continuing to bet. I made like one big bet and I just kept making little bets because I did. I felt like the computers might see one big bet and like run away from that. And so I, I, I didn't want to, I wanted to kind of spread it out. So I kept spreading it out and it kept going up, kept going up and it ended up going off at 380 with like 15,000 bet into the, like the last click that brought me up another 20 cents. It was 360 when they broke and then once it, you know, once the market like closed and like regulated, it was like, like, it, you know, it was, um, it was 380. So here's the stupid part, right? Is in the next race, the, the Baffert horse paid 360. So was it worth it for that 20 cents and the chance that unique Bella was going to get beat? Probably not. But here's what the other thing that we talked about is like, first of all, a lot of computers will bet in the wind pool based on 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 what the double will pays are so there's a possibility that that number wasn't even right it could have even been higher so i was really wrong or maybe it was lower or maybe it wasn't but then the well, you gotta remember was, the effect that your fourteen thousand would have had in the wind pool too i mean that, yeah i think it was like a hundred and a hundred and twenty five thousand was bet into it yeah um, so i mean i'm not the, good the, at, i'm out of my depth with this math but uh, you you can't just pretend though that you could have gotten 
the 360. If your money had been in that pool, uh, you know, you might be looking at 340 or 320, I think. Yeah. I mean, the, the truth is, is I was hoping to get a little bit more than $4. That was my hope because I thought the Baffert would go under that. I was just trying to, you know, it's, it's probably not the smartest play to do every day of the week. But at the same time, I thought Unique Vela was going to win and couldn't lose. It's a really. horrible play every day of the week. But what you have to remember is by making that play, you're increasing your chance of winning your share of 300000 in the in the contest environment, which you successfully did. You ended up netting, in addition to your bankroll, prizes worth over 20000 If that If those shorties are your strongest opinions... It's okay if you're getting chiseled a little bit on your double price because that's what's enabling you to get that 20000 That's why contests are great. Well, the other thing is that it did put me in the lead. Um, and and the 20, I was, it, the, the, the 20 cent difference, if I would have just bet the Baffert to win, if, if all stays equal, which I don't think it would have, which me betting 14000 on multiple. Sure. Uh, it's a twenty. It's a $2,800 difference. That, so, would that have knocked you out of fifth? I'm pretty sure it would have. Oh, yeah, I'm sure it would have knocked me out of fifth. It wouldn't have put me in the lead in the first race. And there's a lot of, I mean, in the first place, there's a lot of things it wouldn't have done. So, you know, it is what it is. I think that, um, I think that we kind of learned a little that the, that the computers will come. They bet more in that double pool than they had really been betting the entire weekend um, because I think that more. You drew them in. Keep, yeah, we drew them in with, with a value opportunity for, for the players that were looking for it. At least Wild. what they perceived that was a value opportunity. Let's talk about both horses in question, starting with Unique Bella. Um, it got a little got a little interesting there at the end, but the race was pretty much over. Yes, I yelled and ex- I yelled a- I yelled an expletive at Mike. I said I said I said blink, Mike. And then you, I thought I was, you thought you were gonna get you thought you were gonna get tagged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was very angry at him for a second, but uh, it all worked out. It was geared, she was geared down enough that you think that's ju- that's not a significant ten point buyer decline from the one hundred three last time to the ninety three this time, or does it give you any pause about her going forward that La Force gets so close? Oh, and there's a lot of pause. I mean, she's going to get beat this year again. I, I, you know, going a mile and an eighth. I mean, I don't I don't think she can win the Churchill in a mile and an eighth, and she'll be the favorite if she shows up there just because, you know. Of, of, of who she is and her name and how she wins. But I don't, uh, I don't think she wants to run that far. Um, I think she's talented as ever, but it just looks like she just, you know, it, it, it's just, it didn't, it didn't look right to me. It looked, you know, it looked a little. What like breeders cup race tired. do you, th- you, you don't think uh, Philly and Mare sprint will be on the cards? No, I mean, no, I mean, she's already a sprint champion. So from a broodmare standpoint, what, what do you really have to gain here? I think, you know, at Fair. this point you're trying to turn her into a brood mare. So I think you want to have a, uh, you know, a add on to the grade ones in, uh, you know, add on to the grade ones for, 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 for the two turn races, the mile and an eighth races, things like that. Now I do think this, I do think that there, it would be a really cool race if her mind your biscuits and, and, uh, and, and some of those showed up in the, in the dirt mile, uh, the one turn dirt mile would, would, could be interesting for her, but uh, who knows what they'll do? It'll be interesting to see. It didn't didn't feel like the extra ground would be the friend, but I do think you could make some apologies based on maybe Mike. The the, the same reason you were cussing. I, I mean, one could argue maybe leaves a little bit more in the tank for later in the year. I don't know. I, I'm I'm tempted to go with what you're saying. Of uh, you don't really want to go much farther, and and she's going to be a tricky horse to bet because of the fame. And um, the, 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 where, the, where the figures are going to stack up next time isn't going to be commensurate with the shortness of the price. Right. Absolutely. Um, yeah. No. She. She's. She. She. She's so talented on the front end that I do ask myself if she ends up in a race where she gets to go twenty four and forty seven going a mile and an eighth. Now will she win? Uh, I'm not really sure, but she she's a sneaky one that takes a ton of money and doesn't have to necessarily win when she gets into a competitive field. I, I think those are good points all. What were the fractions like the other day? Uh, 23 and 1, 46 and 4, 111 and 2. Okay. I mean, pretty even. Um, let's it's talk about... It's funny how your brain can do that now. Did you, do you struggle with that or can you do it pretty good? 
23 and 1 when you're looking at like real num- like the real fraction? No, it's so tough and run-ups make it crazy, you know, and I- I'm not good enough. I'm not even good enough when I'm playing one track with all the different configurations to always remember. Oh, I, no, I, I meant like I meant like can you get the No, I meant like can you can you do the uh you know how in racing we say 23 and 1 which is any like 23 Right, point it could be, two, it's 19 different hundreds it could be. Yeah, yeah uh, I, I just get lucky sometimes. I think sometimes I completely miss, and then sometimes <laughs> I get it right. So, but no one, no one's really checking, right? Well, I don't know, man. You've seen our fans on Twitter. They, you'll, you'll, you'll hear you'll hear from it when you get something wrong. I'm waiting for somebody to time code the six yeah no's from this episode and throw that in our face. Let's talk. I'm going to write an essay thing. about that because I'm going to write an essay about it in sentences. <laughs> I swear there's a reason why I do it. And it actually makes sense. I just can't figure it out. Uh, it's basically a glorified um or er, I'm afraid to tell you. Uh, and now you got me doing it, which is the worst part of all. Roadster, uh, what, you, you had this big bat. What did you think after the break when, when you come out of there about seventh from the rail? Well, one of the one of the things I saw somewhere in a workout report was big acceleration. So I just I just assumed the horse was was um you know was legit fast horse and i thought that even if he missed the break he was going to get himself in a position so even once he he did that i I wasn't too concerned i I was concerned when he wasn't loading when i had all that money on the line um luckily i ran into uh to get confirmation at the at the pdjf jockey karaoke thing which was really funny um mike smith was there and i tom loot had like introduced me i met him a few times but you know whatever it's hard I'm sure he meets a ton of people, but we, we had a conversation. I just said like, look, man, why wouldn't he load? I was nervous. And he said that like the, the bridle like slipped and that's why he was being like, whatever they had to like fix it, adjust it. And then he was fine. He went right in. So it wasn't that he was being like Difficult. tankerish, you know, he just no. was, was that thing kind of had him agitated for whatever it was and they fixed it and he was fine. Visually, I thought it was a tremendous uh, performance. The buyer comes back 81, which I guess for, July, uh, you know, still pretty good. But how, how good do you think this horse is going to be? No, I think he's going to be good. I, I think, you know, um, um, Mike actually mentioned that uh, he's one of the most talented two-year-olds he's sat on in, some, in, in quite some time. So Sure looked uh, that way visually. It, it was yeah. almost arresting that move and, and to get by by that much. That's just not easy in your first start to – you have no position and and still be able to uh, to bury the field like that. We'll have to see what was in behind him. There'll be a lot more clues. Uh, I would imagine uh, it will be the futurity next. Yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking into. Uh, I made a phone call looking into a to a Derby future on this thing. If I can, we'll see. Oh, interesting. I would imagine the hype. There's so much hype on this horse. I can't imagine you're going to get anything good. I was hearing stories about this horse on the backstretch of Saratoga. I was actually well, surprised. I loved when I saw what your double was coming back. I thought you, I thought you, done a really brilliant move because the way they were talking about this horse, even here, it sounded like you were. It was going to be two to five, not not uh, you know or shorter, <laughs> honestly. But I guess it's a loaded Del Mar two year old race. There's a lot of stories out there. Absolutely, yeah. I, mean, I think that with with it being, you know, he's a two year old. He just won once, going six at Del Mar. I think there's. I mean, I don't know. Maybe he will be a silly number, and if he is, I should have maybe looked at doing it before. I, I did that with mastery, and I probably should have done that here before. Yeah, just you're, you're, get like a, you're a white-haired, whatever the price should be, your white-haired friend, you, you can probably cut it in like half, if not a third. That's that's my problem with with with, uh, with, with this. But you never know. I mean, take a look. The, the worst that can happen is the number's too short, and you say no thank you, and you find a, you find another way to extract money out of the horse. It's not uh, not the end of the world if you can't get a derby future down. But do report back on what you hear. I'm very, very curious. All right, speaking of two-year-olds, how about last year's two-year-old champion making a successful return to the races? Uh, another who is just imperious in victory. Good magic back in the winner's circle in the Haskell. Your thoughts, J.K.? Good weekend for Justify, huh? These the, all these horses that uh, he's running against, coming back and running well. I thought Good Magic was good. I mean, I, you know, he was supposed to win that race. It wasn't the toughest of races, and and I think it was a great opportunity for him to kind of get his feet back underneath him, and and hopefully we'll see him in a few weeks at Saratoga. He's Is that what they're saying look- again? I, I have not had a chance to even read the post race recaps yet on this. 
part of me was concerned that it might be a, a Pennsylvania Derby Breeders' Cup situation. But if he's coming here, that would be just fabulous news. And it looks like, looking at the top headlines right now on DRF.com, I'm getting the distinct impression that he is meant to be coming here. Yeah, I mean, I think when you have Stone Street and and uh, and uh, E5 and and Chad Brown and Jose Ortiz, it feels like the whole lot of them would like to run at Saratoga. So um, I think it'll be tough that they that if they don't find their way there. Uh, the Pennsylvania Derby is a is a nice big race, but it's not the Travers. And so, regardless of what you're trying to accomplish, you know, I think that he's he'd be the favorite in there. So it'd be silly for them not to run. Yeah, there's there's uh, there's hemming and hawing quotes in this uh, in this article by David Grenning. There's some hemming and hawing quotes, but it does but it does sound like that's the way they're leaving. Chad Brown also has Gronkowski. Lots of chatter around Saratoga JK about how well Gronkowski has been training. Obviously, we talked about Tenfold. He'll be showing up. Hofberg, uh, God willing, in the creek don't rise, will be showing up. And now the news that Wonder Godot. Sounds like she'll be joining the party. Could be a really, really great Travers uh, shaping up for a few weeks' time. Yeah, no, definitely. It's going to be good. For, did I say yeah, no? No, I think you just said yeah that time, unless I missed it. We're going <laughs> to we're gonna tighten this up. This will be the last show you ever hear it, people, so just be, be prepared for that. Last yeah. time we're ever going to have dodgy Wi-Fi, the last time we're ever going to say yeah, no. And that's a promise. <laughs> No, it should be fun. I'm I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I, I'm actually thinking about maybe coming back. I didn't even tell you that. So we'll see. I think you should. I think you definitely should. There's there, there will it's always like three be years, three years in a row. I've told myself I wasn't coming, and then I somehow ended up at the Travers. <laughs> well, there's always room for you in the little house on the east side, even if it's an as we've done in the past, an air mattress on the floor of the kitchen. We'll find a way to squeeze you in if you want to if you want to make your way back here. Uh, always a good time when J.K. is in Saratoga surveying his kingdom at the Paddock Bar where I'm just the lowly president. Um, <laughs> if you had to pick right now the winner of this Travers, uh, I think everybody probably knows which way I'm going with this. Not that interested. Seeing the way this field is looking to shake up, not too interested in the 7-4 to four on Hofburg that I could actually get at this point, but very interested in Hofburg the horse. Where would your where would your money go, uh, or or maybe not money, but if you were to just make a pick right now, um, where where who would it be? Yeah, probably good magic. I like the fact that he's just tactical. He's a grinding type. He's run well at a mile and a quarter already with his performance in the Derby, off of what we already know was a good pace, and off of what we already and, and went head to head with with a triple crown winner. So I, I think he's probably the most likely winner in that spot. In that spot, if he if he gets there, and plus it's Chad Brown and can't really uh bet against him at saratoga so i think good magic is probably gonna be the most likely winner uh however it would be interesting to see who else shows up there if he can find someone you know i was really interested in sporting chance if he would have ran in, in the jim dandy but well but he's he's a he is a nut job uh, yeah, he's think, crazy to, to say he's the a least, menace so. he's a menace you, you worry that something real bad's gonna happen with that horse someday and i'm just really tired of seeing that act because I, I always just Fear the worst when that type of thing's going on. Good Magic gets the 98 in the Haskell. I guess my fear would be the historical difficulty. It's Horses have done it. I'm looking at one right now uh, on my wall, point given. Horses have done the Haskell Travers double, but I don't like it. Um, but I don't understand why. It's four weeks, I just weeks, think it's right? two really hard races. And but, I think but isn't see- that the Florida Derby and the Kentucky Derby? I mean, isn't that the Wooden no, Girl and the Kentucky I mean, Derby? Historically, Florida Derby horses do great in the Kentucky Derby, or at least but don't I'm do saying, what's the worse than isn't average. That the same, isn't that the same thing? You're running in a mile and an eighth grade. No, because the Florida race. Derby is also a prep race. You know, It's like a stated prep race for it, whereas I think the Haskell, with as much as it's worth, you get you get to the bottom of horses uh, a little bit more. Well, now that we've talked about it all, we'll go through and we'll look at the list. But I just my strong sense is I've seen horses um, throughout the years, especially – in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, just not run, not improve from one to the other. And, I, and you know, you're going to have to improve that 98 to win the Travers. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't disagree with what you're saying. It's just, uh, hmm. I think different races have different relationships. I mean, I don't think you can compare it to the Florida Derby and the Kentucky Derby. 
here's what I think happened. I think that a lot of the horses that run in the Haskell are the horses that, that, that target the Haskell as their summer destination are horses that maybe don't want to get the mile and a quarter when you look That's at like a good a coil, theory. coil, That's a good Verrazano. Um, I'd even say Byron, even though he, you know, he's giggling because he won the classic, but I think you know what I mean yeah. by that. Um, don't get me started on that. And so then you, 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 now you see horses that are, I think other horses that think the mile and quarter is best for them. I think they probably wait and, and try to get, to get to that be their peak performance. So that, I, I, I that's a good that point. Be- I think that's a good point. If you think good magic really wants longer and, and maybe the, the sharper race and the Haskell was a hindrance, I don't really feel like that's the case, but I mean, I can, I can see the, I can certainly see that that's an argument for why some of those have underperformed. Cause you did mention a bunch right there who were good in the Haskell and did not, did not project to improve, to be better in a mile and a quarter. And even Byron, I think, you know, very, uh, for, uh, you know, we don't need to deconstruct it, but <laughs> yeah, he won, but dot, 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 <laughs> go back and watch the race and figure out why you won. It wasn't like he was better at a mile and a quarter, um, in my opinion anyway. So, so, so there is, you know, there's two ways of looking at it. It's good to have, it's good to have some disagreement on the show. And I'm not saying I'd toss the horse with impunity or anything. I'm just saying he looks to me like if the market does go crazy for him, one that I would at least take, uh, I, I think I would be using as opposed to keen. Um, but it's going to be really interesting. There's a lot of ways to go. Hopefully uh, the Gronkowski Hype machine continues to roll if you're looking to bet one of those others. Uh, but on another level, how cool would it be to see that horse um, show that that Belmont second was legitimate? What's your gut on him? I mean, we had so little to go on. Obviously ran this huge race, but it was a mile and a half. Do you think that's going to translate to a race like the Travers for Gronkowski? Yeah, you know, I, I you know, I got to see Luke this weekend, and and he's you know obviously the the, the head guy or making all the decisions or most racing of manager Phoenix, for Phoenix racing man for Phoenix thoroughbreds, and so uh, he said that that he's getting he's getting a lot of good indications from Chad. The horse is doing well, and so they're excited about running him there. I, I don't think it was flukish what he did. The, the move he made on the turn I thought was really impressive, and just you know got a little tired late, and that was after missing the start. So yeah. I think with what he did within that race. Uh, can find uh, find the ability for him to improve. I still am curious to see what's going to happen when he eventually, you know, gets over to the grass. I know that they had always anticipated he was going to be a, a grass type, and so we'll see what happens when he when he actually gets there. But I think he'll definitely be live in that situation. He'll obviously need some pace to close into, but he's definitely live. Might get it if everybody shows up, and, and there is a certain obviously the mile and a half for. for I feel like for thoroughbreds in, in this day and age, those same attributes that helped him to excel at a mile and a half could also help him excel at a mile and a quarter. And when I say I hope he gets bet because I want to bet the others, I'm not saying I don't think he has a chance. He's just what I feel like the my gut as to what the prices are going to be probably be one more in that um, more in the category of of use if not fade than uh, one like Hofberg, who I'm very interested in keying and starting to think he might be, if everybody shows up, he could be a decent price. He could be very interesting bet for me later this summer. Um, are you anti him or are you just sort of like what I'm saying, but in reverse, use, use, but don't key. Use, but don't key. I don't want to say anti. He can definitely win, but I just, I'm just not a huge fan. I think he's a talented horse, but um, I prefer to be high on horses that are going to find themselves towards the front half of the field. And I feel like in a real race, in a real pace, he's going to be a little bit further back. And that always makes me a little bit hesitant. It, it, it is a trickier way to go, that's for sure. And you typically want to get compensated either in price or at least by being able to design a race where there's going to be enough run up front. Uh, we'll know a lot more in a few weeks' time if that's going to be the case for Hofburg. I had some good questions, but we're out of time. We'll get to them uh We'll get to them on Friday. Any closing thoughts for you, JK, before we wrap up this episode of the DRF Players Podcast? I'm assuming you haven't looked at your texts during the show? No. I'm uh, afraid our, to touch I'm afraid to touch my phone because uh, the last time I did it, it we, we it was probably a coincidence, but we, we lost the Wi-Fi for 20 seconds. Our uh, our buddy Clay Sanders text that we got a little inflammation and we will long on value will not be running this week. Oh, that's really sad. That's a bummer. Uh, But obviously got to do what's best for the horse. Uh, He was slated to run in the Troy. Hopefully 
that will take care of itself, and there'll be another plan for the horse. Boy, he's been uh, a fun one, and, and great to see what he's accomplished this year. We'll take a look at that and uh, and and report back in uh, future editions of the show. Anything else for you, J.K., or are we wrapped? That's it. All right, good stuff. Um, we will be back on Friday looking ahead to an exciting weekend of racing. You know, producer Craig's going to be in Saratoga, I think, it, 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 he was talking about doing a show all in person at some point. I don't know if he, that was for this weekend or next weekend. We'll talk to him about that. But it sounds like you and I, at least, will be in the same place and we'll be back on Friday. Thank you, JK. Uh, great job, as always. Thanks to producer Craig, Willie Nile, for providing the theme song, voice of the Kentucky Derby and DRF Players Podcast, Travis Stone. Most of all, thanks to all of you for listening. I'm Peter Thomas Fornital. May you win all your photos. <laughs>